Well, 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 if it isn't a high core count CPU. I haven't worked with one of you big boys in years. And you're from AMD's brand new Ryzen 7000 series lineup? Let's freaking go, dude! And by that I mean, let's go take a nap and let you mature for a little bit. See, while there's a lot to get excited about when it comes to AMD's brand new Ryzen chips, like insanely high clock speeds, a generous IPC boost, a brand new platform, and DDR5 support, as we'll see in this review of the Ryzen 9 7900X, it might be a good idea to let that excitement simmer down just a little bit before actually buying them. Unlike my excitement about today's video sponsor PC Builder, which will never simmer down. PC Builder is a service currently available at Computer Mania here in South Africa that makes building your first custom PC or buying a capable pre-built an absolute breeze. Simply pick the games you want to play, select your budget, and PC Builder does the rest, putting together a system aimed at maximizing your frame rates while also sticking to your budget. What makes PC Builder extra cool is that it tells you exactly how many juicy frames you'll be able to get out of the system at whatever resolution and settings you'll be playing at. And it also lets you customize the build as much as you want. Don't like the case? Switch it out. Want a motherboard with more USB ports? Grab it. Simple as that. The tool will even let you know if the parts that you want to add aren't compatible with the rest of the build and gives you a list of other parts that are compatible. PC Builder also keeps track of the power demands of your system and will let you know what power supply you need and heck, it'll even help you pick out the best peripherals to go along with your system. Once you're happy with your new rig, PC Builder and Computer Mania will put it all together, install Windows for you, and it includes a free month of Xbox Game Pass. All systems go through the testing and benchmarking gauntlet to make sure that it's ready to go as soon as you get your hands on it, and all builds come standard with a two-year warranty. Almost double compared to the rest of the competition. And on top of that, each component in the system is also still covered by their manufacturer warranties. Warrantyception. If any of that sounds good to you, and why wouldn't it, check out the PC Builder tool at Computer Mania right now using the link in the description, or if you want to pick up any of the parts featured in this video or anything else, grab it all at Take A Lot, also linked down below the like button. Now, because we're a couple of weeks late on this review, I'm not going to give you the full rundown of all the new things that the new Ryzen chips bring to the table. Everyone else has already been there and has probably done it better than I have already. But it's still worth taking a quick look at the most important ones, or at least the ones that matter most to me. AMD's Zen 4 based 7000 series chips are, of course, equipped with PCIe 5.0, Wi-Fi 6E, and DDR5 support. None of which is exactly all that new anymore, but still really cool to have nonetheless. The chips have jumped the 7 nanometer ship to land in an even smaller, more efficient, and overall speedier 5 nanometer speedboat, and they've even gone and switched to a different range of motherboards. The new 600 series boards all come strapped with the new AM5 socket. So goodbye to the pins on your Ryzen CPUs and hello to a crazy and scary amount of much more fragile pins on your motherboard. Before I started working on this video, I thought switching to the new pin arrangement was pretty stupid, since I've broken many board pins on Intel's LGA boards before, but I've never broken a single pin on any of my Ryzen CPUs before. And technically, I still haven't, but my 5600X kind of maybe died a little, or a lot, and it was perhaps probably my fault since I think I see some damage uh, on a couple of the pins. So uh, yeah, having the ability to switch out the boards rather than the chips, which are usually the pricier of the two, is probably the better way to go. Anyway, the new chips also launched alongside Expo, AMD's version of the XMP profiles used to easily overclock your RAM, but a little more robust and geared towards much higher overclocking. Then there's Precision Boost 2, an updated version of Precision Boost Overdrive, and all of that good stuff. All the new chips come with RDNA 2 graphics strapped to their backs, which will always be super useful for troubleshooting, and we should be seeing a very healthy 13% IPC or instructions per clock boost over the last generation. Some other good news is that if you're already running a Ryzen system, your cooler will probably work just fine with the new chips too, since they're basically using the same mounting system. So as long as you don't have one of those coolers that require a specific backplate, those are built into the new boards by the way, then you should be good to go. And speaking of going, I think it's time to get this review going. So uh, let's see what we're working with here. So just like last generation's Ryzen 9 5900X, the new Boy 7900X is also a 12-core, 24-thread behemoth. But that's about where the similarities end. Whereas the older chip had impressive, for the time anyway, base and boost clocks of 3.7 and 4.8 GHz respectively, 
The 7900X comes out swinging. It's big, juicy, girthy. Yeah, the 7900X crushes the last gen part with a base clock of 4.7 and a massive boost clock of 5.6 gigahertz. That's enough to make almost any chip nowadays feel a little insecure. Except for a bunch of other new chips that just swaggered their way onto the scene. But we'll get to that later. Adding to that insecurity, the 7900X also ships with double the L2 cache at 12 megabytes, natively supports DDR5 speed up to 5200 mega transfers per second, has that aforementioned iGPU built in, granted of the cut down RDNA2 variety, but still, and is built for the AM5 platform. A platform that still has its whole life ahead of it, while AM4 has already divorced its wife, bought that Mustang it's always wanted, and is chilling on the beach dual wielding cocktails. Oh, and the 7900X also has a much higher TDP of 170 watts and a max operating temperature of 95 degrees. A temperature which AMD claims the chip should be running at when under high load. The chip should keep boosting clock speeds all the way as high as it can go or as high as your cooler will allow it to, which is both super interesting and just a little bit unnerving. But we'll get to temperatures, clock speeds and all of that good stuff in just a bit because I think it's about time we got into some benchmarks. Our test system for the 7900X includes MSI's beefy RX 6900XC, Gaming Trio Plus, running at stock settings, a single 32GB kit of DDR5 from Crucial, MSI's new Pro X670P motherboard, a Crucial P5 Plus as our main drive, MSI's Core Liquid 360R to keep the chip relatively cool, and Antec's signature 1000W power supply. The test bench for the other chips shares most of the same parts except for the switch to MSI's X570 Ace motherboard and two 16 gigabyte modules of Crucial's Ballistics RGB DDR4 running at 3600 MHz CL16. Now, before we kick things off with productivity benchmarks, you'll notice that there are two 7900X configurations. And that's because the stock speed of the Crucial DDR5 module was running a little too slow for my liking, so I overclocked that to 5600 MHz and tightened timings to CL38. Now, let's get into it. So remember when I said I haven't worked with a high core count CPU in a while? Yeah, I wasn't kidding. I have no chips on hand that have more than like eight cores and 16 threads to add to the charts. So obviously with its abundance of cores and threads, the 7900X absolutely dominates when it comes to Cinebench's multi-core test, posting the highest number I've ever personally gotten. But thankfully the extra cores don't count towards the single core test, and in that one, the chip comes out on top too, and gets an extra little bump with overclocked RAM. Bender being a similarly core heavy benchmark tells the same story as Cinebench's multitest. That story being that more cores and more threads equals more better. With the 7900X just about doubling the scores of the other chips in the lineup. Peachet Bench's Photoshop benchmark tends to favor higher clock speeds and with the 7900X having the highest of the bunch, it's no surprise that it comes out on top here. Although not as high as you might expect. And if you're wondering about the Premiere Pro scores, yeah, they're all a little low for basically all of the chips. And that's just because while the 6900X CI use for testing is amazing uh, in games, it does suffer in the video production department when compared to NVIDIA cards. But even so, the 7900X still commands an admirable lead over the rest of the chips. In 7-Zip's built-in benchmark, the 7900X is the very clear winner when it comes to decompression tasks. But when it comes to compression, with the stock RAM configuration, it doesn't exactly blow the competition out of the water. It's only when we up our RAM speed and lower our timings that we see a much more thorough thrashing coming from the 7900X. This, I think, helps explain some of the more interesting numbers we're about to see in the gaming benchmarks. So let's transition to those. And kicking things off is Unigen's Superposition benchmark. And at 1080p with high settings, the 7900X does come out on top if ever just so slightly thanks to the 5800X3D's immense cache horsepower. 3 d Mark Time Spy paints a similar picture, although in this case, the 5800X3D doesn't present nearly as much of a threat to the 7900X here, and the latter takes the crown. Though keep an eye on just how much of an improvement we got from just overclocking our DDR5 module. Our first real game results come courtesy of Civilization 6, where both configurations of the 7900X easily outpace the rest of the chips. In The Witcher 3, while the 7900X with stock RAM settings just barely loses to the 5800X 3D, after a quick tweak to said RAM, the 7900X walks out victorious by a fairly decent margin. So, pretty good stuff so far. Or at least that's what I initially thought. 
See, one of the big problems for the 7900X here is the mere existence of AMD's own 5800X 3D. The 5800X 3D with its balls to the wall stacked L3 cache was, and still is, one hell of a gaming CPU. And I'm planning an update to my review of it soon, so uh, you're going to want to stick around for that. The 5800X 3D ended up scoring higher average FPS numbers than the 7900X in a whopping 14 of the 16 games I tested, with the 7900X only coming out on top in The Witcher 3 and Civilization 6. Now, of course, it wasn't a landslide victory for the 5800X 3D in all 14 of the games where it came out on top. In fact, in the case of 8 of those games, the 7900X only fell behind by less than 5% or so, which is interesting but nothing to really write home about. What definitely is something to write your mom and dog about are the remaining 6 games where the 5800X3D's dominance was undeniable. In those games, the average improvement over the 7900X, even with the tuned DDR5, ranged from 9% in Hitman 3 and Far Cry New Dawn, all the way up to around 20% in Cyberpunk and Shadow of the Tomb Raider. With all the totals tallied up, the 5800X3D managed to outpace the 7900X by 6.2% overall in my testing. This is by no means something I'd expected to see from a brand new chip on a brand new platform with a host of new and improved features to back them up. So uh, what the hell is happening here? Well, the lazy and dumb answer is that the 5800X3D is just the superior gaming chip overall and blah, 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 I'm not listening. But that's not what's happening here. While the 5800X3D still absolutely holds its own in a lot of titles, I don't think we're dealing with an entirely fair fight here. For all the awesome new features coming with Zen 4 and the new AM5 platform, the configuration used in my testing was by no means at its like final form. There are still bugs to work out, like certain games not playing well with the dual CCD configuration of the 7900X and 7950X, and a couple of other little growing pains that will be ironed out as the whole thing matures. Along with that, keep in mind that we were only using a single module of DDR5 here. And sure, while it's still technically dual channel, I can't help but feel like another module tossed in here would have helped a lot. And while we're on the topic, the big gains I saw after tweaking the module in question tells me that if we were running a module slash modules with higher speeds and lower latencies, we'd have almost definitely seen a very different story play out. And then finally, let's not forget that even though the 6900 XT is, or at least was, one of the best gaming cards you could get, and even though every effort was made to reduce bottlenecking as much as possible, there is always still a chance that it played a role in lowering some of the numbers we just looked at. But even if we don't take all that into account, the 7900X is still a mammoth of a chip, one that excels in productivity workloads, and when looking at the 5800X, only loses to the last gen chip in three of the games tested. Three the results that would have undoubtedly gone in favor of the new chip, if not for the points I just mentioned. Now before we get to the reason I titled this video the way I did, let's take a look at a few more interesting numbers. So as I mentioned near the start of this video, the 7900X and all of the 7000 series chips are supposed to run hot. And wouldn't you know it, it sure does. While idle, the chip sits at like 42 degrees or so, so nothing special there. But after some heavy stress testing and while playing like super CPU demanding games, the chip settles in nicely at that 95 degree mark and I actually saw it maxing out at a toasty 98 degrees. Again, this is supposedly totally normal and the chip should be able to run at that temp with no issues, but if you're not comfortable with it, then I highly suggest you check out Optimum Tech's video on like tuning the PBO2 settings. He was able to get some really insane results. Now, like I mentioned, the reason these chips do run hot is that they're supposed to push frequencies as far as possible without completely overwhelming your cooler. And with my configuration, the chip was able to push past its advertised max boost clock, hitting 5.7 gigahertz for single core. While under an all core load, it settled in at a reasonable 4.9 gigahertz. Impressive stuff. I'm definitely going to jump into some PBO2 settings for my own chip to see how much faster I can push this thing. As for our X670 chipset slotted into MSI Sexy, albeit slightly less feature-packed Pro board, that stayed cool under pressure. We only managed to hit 51 degrees on the chipset itself, while the board's VRMs only hit 49.5 degrees, which for the performance we're getting is very cool indeed. Okay, now that we've got most of the hard numbers out of the way, it's time to get into some hard facts to uh, draw some kind of conclusion here. Fact number one. AMD's Ryzen 7000 series chips are a good upgrade over the previous generation, and the new platform brings with it a ton of new features and possibilities. Fact number two, 
Even though I wasn't able to get the absolute most out of the chip with my current configuration, the 7900X still impressed me. And I think it's a great compromise for gamers who also like to use their systems for like professional applications. Fact number three, the 5800X3D exists. And even in benchmarks I've seen from my te fellow tech YouTubers who like have more appropriate test systems, it's still more than managed to hold its own against the new chips. Fact number four, Intel's 13th gen exists. And from what I've seen online and from some of my own preliminary numbers, which I'll drop in an upcoming review, stay tuned for that, those chips go hard and present a very real threat to the 7000 series. And finally, fact number five, and this is the big one. Becoming an early adopter of AIM5 and the new 7000 series chips is gonna be an expensive endeavor for a good while. One that might not be worth it for gaming right now due to the existence of the 5800X2D and Intel's 13th gen. Just to put things into some kind of perspective, I spec'd out two different builds. One rocking the 5800X2D, the X570 equivalent board to the X670 we used in testing, and some of the cheapest but relatively high spec DDR4 RAM you can get right now. And the cost for those parts alone came out to about $680. The second system includes the new 7700X, since that's the more realistic competitor to the 5800X3D, especially at about the same price. The exact same X670P board we used in our test system and a somewhat budget-friendly kit of DDR5 RAM from Crucial. The cost for these parts came out to a whopping $900. And if you've been doing the math, you'll know that the new system comes in at a price premium of 32%, which is kind of ridiculous. Even if all of the stars aligned for the 7900X in my benchmarks, I can pretty much guarantee that whatever uplift we'd see in performance wouldn't be quite enough to justify that much of a price gap. For me, anyway. You could argue that going with one of the new cheaper B650 motherboards would reduce that price gap, and you'd be right. But then again, you would also pair the 5800X3D with an equivalent B550 motherboard, which you can get for a heck of a lot cheaper as well. And as for Intel's 13th gen, that muddies the water more than a little bit too. While Team Blue's new chips do seem to be on the pricier side of things right now, they perform close to, if not better, than their 7000 series equivalents in a bunch of gaming and productivity scenarios. They should also still work just fine with last generation's motherboards, which have dropped in price significantly, and you can even find boards that support DDR4, cutting the price of entry by a significant chunk a chunk that more than makes up for the price premium of most of the chips themselves. Of course, none of this means that there's no light at the end of the Ryzen 7000 series tunnel, since the board prices and EDR5 will come down like as time goes on, and the platform is still in its infancy right now and has some major potential to become even better over the coming months. But all I can say right now is that the 7900X paired with a good board and high speed, lower latency RAM is an absolute beast of a chip. One that I wouldn't feel bad at all about buying. Um, maybe just not right now. And yeah, that's all I got for you in this video. Let me know in the comments whether all these new chips have you itching to upgrade or whether you're still happy with what you've got. And while you're down there, go ahead and check out the PC Builder tool available at Computer Mania if you want the excitement of building a sexy new PC, but don't want to deal with picking and like putting all the parts together yourself. Or if you just want to grab any of the parts in this video or anything else for that matter, do it at TakeLot, also linked down below. Oh, and for the real ones out there who made it this far into the video, I got a fancy new camera for the channel, which I shot everything in this video with, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about the quality compared to the previous videos. Did you notice at all, other than being able to go to 4K in the little gear icon? Let me know. And yeah, see you all in the next one. Cheers.